It's U of L today on 93.9 The Bill. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Bill. We've got some uh, a couple familiar guests coming up here in just a few minutes, but uh, let's talk about what we got coming up on the show today. And for those of you who listen regularly, you know this is a show about all things University of Louisville, the good news and the good stuff coming out of U of L. So, on the show today, you know about all the sexual harassment allegations hitting movie stars, politicians, CEOs, costing many of them their careers. But what is and isn't sexual harassment from a legal standpoint, and how did the hashtag MeToo movement get started? A U of L law professor who has an interest in gender, workplace, and First Amendment issues will be here to talk about that uh, hot topic right now. But first, they've worked together at the University of Louisville Archives Department for a long, 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 (laughs) long, long time. And now they've put together a history of U of L's Belknap campus together. Tom Owen and Sherry Pawson are here to talk about some of the history of U of L's main campus. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Good to see you. Between us, we think uh, 70 years. 70 years? (laughs) Not 70 years old, 70 years you worked together, right? right. Well, total together. Together. Come on. 70 years, right. (laughs) Uh, Well, Sherry, you have not been on this program before. Tom's been on many times, uh, so welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to see you. Happy to be here. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about this uh, book that you've written. It's called University of Louisville Belknap Campus by Tom Owen and Sherry Pawson, the Campus History Series. Is this the uh, first or second or third in uh, a series? What's the deal here? Uh, Arcadia Publishers actually has a series of campus histories of other university campuses. Gotcha. So that's why it's that's where they that, that subtitle. Right. Okay. So why did you guys decide to do a book about the Belknap campus, Sherry? It was a story that needed to be told. Um, there had been one previous history, but it was a comprehensive history. This is... Um, picture focused with captions and it just tells the history through uh, those great images from expansion of buildings all the way through campus life um, everything and you, and you guys have got access to all that stuff because you're in the archives department, uh, right? All those pictures, right? Not only photographs, but documentation, the old cardinals, the old yearbooks, all of those things provided source materials for putting this 128-page book together. Okay, and it's on sale now at a <laughs> bookstale near you, right? That Book is store true, near you? yes. Uh, that's right. All right, yeah. well, let's talk a little bit about um, the Belknap campus. As you were digging through... Um, the pictures and the archival documents and those kinds of things. What was the most interesting thing that stuck out to you that maybe you didn't know or you don't think anybody else knows about the University of Louisville Belknap campus? Well, I know what surprised Tom and I, I think, um, prior to the campus being there, uh, before it was a reform school orphanage, there was a cemetery, uh, basically where the playhouse originated, where the extra library is. Forever, we thought the the area had been constituted a cemetery, but no bodies had ever been buried there. And then the orphanage came, then the then U of L came. As it turns out, in our research, there were bodies buried there. And when the land was reappropriated for the orphanage, those bodies were moved to Cave Hill. Oh, they were moved. So we don't have buried, uh, bodies buried under the library right now. Uh, ter- that's exactly right. <laughs> they were disinterred. Is that uh-huh. the right word I'm yes. looking for? And reinterred. And, uh, okay. So we went from, a, in the 1850s, a cemetery. Then in 1860, uh, the campus was first developed, and that was developed as a city-owned orphanage and reform school called the House of Refuge, later the Louisville Industrial School of Reform. It existed on that site, except just as it started, the Civil War broke out and the Union Army appropriated the building that had been built for the reform school for the orphanage and the, uh, and the delinquent and the vagrant children. And so it was not formally opened until 1865. But then for the next um, uh, 35 plus 25 gives you 60, 60 years. <laughs> Thank correct. you very much. For the next 60 years, so the campus, uh, 1923, okay. the reform school combined with its county equivalent at Armsby Village, and then the University of Louisville moved in, formally getting there in 1925. All right. Well, let's go back, uh, back as far as I can remember on uh, the University of Louisville. It says on all the documents and everything you see about the University of Louisville was founded in 1792. 
98. 98. Or 1798, I'm sorry. Right, right. Different 1792. That's the state of Kentucky. (laughs) 1798. So where did that come from, Sherry? And what was actually at the Belknap campus site in 1798? It wasn't a university. What Um, was it? Farmland. Well, yeah. Yeah. So so they how did. can we say that the University of Louisville was founded in 1798 then? <laughs> oh, Jerry? Well, we, we trace, the, uh, as Tom likes to say, it's a dotted line back to the Jefferson Seminary, which is where U L the, the money for the Jeff, Jefferson Seminary was then put into the Louisville Collegiate Academy, yes. and then on and on. And all of those then became various medical schools and a law school, which then became U of L. So it's not like the doors of the University of Louisville opened in 1798. There were pieces. Yes. A dotted line ancestry. And in fact, there's a little bit of twinkle in the book. We've got a photograph of <laughs> oh, the gosh. entrance of Belknap campus there on Third Street. And the sign says University of Louisville, founded. 1837. <laughs> <laughs> so who decided along the way that we're going to make well, 1798 here's the founding? The, here's the story as I tell it. Okay. And, uh, it, there's it may a, or may not be true. There's a twinkle. <laughs> there's a tongue-in-cheek. There's a twinkle. But in 1937, the university celebrated its centennial. Eleven years later, it's it's celebrated its sesquicentennial. <laughs> okay. So it went from 100 to 125 or 150 years. 150 years. years. In, 11 really years. in 11, 11 years. years. That's right. Okay. And that took some imagination. That took some fresh research. But the truth of the matter is there is a di- dotted line ancestry that I think legitimately goes back to 7, 1798. But the name University of Louisville, formally, with the creation of a of a medical school and a law school by those titles is 1846. So that's the the fairer time to say that the mm-hmm. uh, that U of L as we sort of know it today it, except, is 1846. Except the reason we can I think very legitimately get to 1837 is that the medical school actually when all it did was change its name on the front of the building from the Louisville Medical Institute of 1837, then in 1846, the University of Louisville Medical School. And that, of course, I assume, was down on the Health Sciences campus in downtown Louisville, right? Well, uh, downtown. Yes. Right, down, yeah. t- downtown. Yeah. So yeah. is that included in your book? Are the University of Louisville Belknap Campus, Sherry? Is the is the medical school in here since it's actually <laughs> on the campus downtown? Well, the book clearly focuses on the Belknap Campus and the history of those buildings. But we do, because of the 1798 and because we do have that heritage all the way back, we do uh, touch on those aspects. But we mostly focus on Belknap Campus. Gotcha. All right. We're and talk- we frankly move pretty quickly uh, from the early story, the cemetery, the reform school. The By the way. University of Louisville today still uses buildings that belong to the old reform school. Um, we literally just reappropriated them for, for university use. But we pretty quickly get to the 1950s, and this book focuses on expansion, campus changes, social and cultural changes, sports, other aspects of university life from the 1950s forward. Again, we're talking with Tom Owen and Sherry Pawson, who are both in the archives department at the University of Louisville, and they together have written a book called The University of Louisville Belknap Campus. Perfect for Christmas uh, gift giving, eh? Is uh-huh. that, is that the, is that Absolutely. The one? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about the, the history of the University of Louisville. It came into the state system in 1970. You said, Tom, that you in the 1950s was a period of big growth, right? So what happened in the 1950s, between 1950 and 1970, that UofL grew and went from being a private university to becoming a public institution? I don't know. One of you pick it up. I don't well, know. Sherry, Tom? I, I think the dramatic image for me is a diagonal street that literally – crossed what we now think as the uh, um, the grassy area, what do we call it? The quad. Quad. Right. quad. <laughs> in front of the there library. Was yeah. In front of the library. Literally a main street that separated the old campus, the pre-1959 campus. Uh, we literally crossed that street in the late 1950s. And then inexorably, the university grew dramatically over the next 25, 35 years, all the way to Avery Street, 
Which I don't is, even know where, where is Avery Street. No now, longer exists. No, no now you, we're on it. Oh. It's called it's called Cardinal Boulevard. Oh, okay, Cardinal <laughs> Boulevard. I, I got you. So, and and we're recording this show on Cardinal Boulevard in the ESPN right. uh, old uh, Avery Street by the Reckoning. And there you go. There you go. <laughs> Sherry Pawson and Tom Owen, archivist at the University of Louisville, are my guests, and they are talking about their book, University of Louisville Belknap Campus. And Sherry, it's mostly. Mostly pictures, which is great for a guy like me who's uneducated and doesn't need to, to read much. Uh, so that's, no that, big that's words. a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah no big words, yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about the, the life of the Belknap campus. And, and, you know, you've got lots of pictures in here of athletics and uh, the Cardinal Inn, which I remember uh, from a long time ago. But what are some of the iconic images of the Belknap campus and activities that happened on the Belknap campus over the years that, that you found interesting when you were researching and trying to put together the book well if if you open that book to almost any page you're going to look at you're going to see things and you're going to say oh wow i remember that like you say the cardinal inn which there were three cardinal inns not I just one that. cardinal inn i just remember the one in the late 70s early 80s when i was coming up from western kentucky university and we we're looking for a place to drink near the campus and where was so, it located uh over off uh, floyd street i think it was near uh, i-65 yeah. that's number three that's okay. number three okay. so there were two okay. prior to that so yeah and and they're all represented in there so campus hangouts are there campus activities like um the parade like a homecoming we uh I think we've recently learned that we've resurrected a homecoming parade, but for years we had a homecoming parade downtown, a big parade for homecoming. That's in there. Um, all the places where people would have hung out um, in, on campus as well, as far as like in the sub and um, the sub. What was the sub? Was that it the was dining hall or it it was um, in the basement of the. Miller Technology. Yes, in the uh, yeah. yes, and okay. um, it was It was there were pool tables, uh, all that kind of stuff. That was a place to go. So to, it was a student rec center, basically. Yes, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, until they built the Swain Center with the, the SAC, the Student right. Activity sure. Center. Mm-hmm. When was that built? When was it? Nineteen ninety. 1990, okay, that recent. Yeah, and renamed Mm -hmm. for the Swains, Mm -hmm. uh, president of the university and his wife, and as I recall, 1998. Yeah, as I was leafing through this, I noticed the picture of Angel McCautry in there playing basketball, one of the basketball stars at UofL, probably arguably the greatest player from UofL. Don't tell Daryl Griffin I said that. (laughs) Um, But are there lots of sports images as well? Um, A a good number, yes. I mean, we try to tell the story such as women's basketball predates men's basketball at the university, and they were very successful. They took a 25-year hiatus where there was no women's basketball, but then they came back and they're doing great number three right now. So, um, yes, sports is in there. Um, Also, social change on campus. We, uh, as the campus got more in, you know, aware of things going on in the world, um, um, Martin Luther King visited here. Um, I know it's one of Tom's favorite pictures in the book. Um, The, the, um, the room where he spoke was so full, students are... Students are, peering through the windows. Yes, yeah. uh, sitting in the open that's windows. A, that's a great yes. picture. I've seen yeah. that before. Yeah. I'll tell you one, speaking of sports, the University of Louisville football program's first bowl game... Poinsettia Bowl? Oh, no. No? There was a racially separate part of the University of Louisville that was a part of a political arrangement... And a state requirement that whites and blacks could not go to school in close proximity to one another. So for 20 years, there was a Louisville Municipal College from 1931 to 1951. And in 1947, the Louisville Municipal College of the University of Louisville, Bantam football team, (laughs) team. played in the Vulcan Bowl. The what bowl? Vulcan Bowl. And lost. Unfortunately, they lost. <laughs> yes. But that's the U of L football team, uh, University of Louisville football team, because LMC was very much a part of the University of Louisville for blacks only. Wow. Separated from Belknap campus. I guess that was before we had Mr. Spock on Star Trek, who was a Vulcan, right? Is that, that, <laughs> that's, that's right. Yes. That, right. <laughs> we're talking with Tom Owen, Sherry Pawson, uh, U of L archives, and we're talking about their book, University of Louisville Belknap Campus. What? What would you tell folks um, from 1970, once we became a state institution until now, what were the biggest changes and biggest things that happened at the University of Louisville um, 
for those, what is that, 47 years? I think um, a dramatic second wave of building from 50 to 70. We certainly, as Tom said, expanded across Ship Street, went into that old neighborhood. But then after we came into the state system and had an influx of money, we also expanded greatly and are still doing so today, as you see, as we go all the way out Floyd Street to Papa John's. Mm -hmm. that has That trajectory has continued. I think also we became increasingly a welcome place and the campus became increasingly a destination mm -hmm. with many, many wonderful, beautiful, sweet spots. Um, so those, I think the social change was as important as the building change. Much more welcoming to people of uh, who were gay. Much more accessible to people with disabilities. Much more um, sensitive to people of different uh, different cultures. And so, as a result, I think the campus just became both a destination, physical destination, as well as a much more welcoming place. That's the big difference. I notice all the photos in here are in black and white. Why? It's a requirement of the publisher. And, really? and uh, most of them are probably most black of them are black and white. <laughs> but, but there are several that are uh, newer pictures that were yes. in oh, yeah. color. Yes. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Um, so why did the publisher want black and white? What was the? What I was think the, deal the on that? I think the key is to keep the price yeah. that affordable. Oh, okay. gotcha. mm -hmm. So therefore, with color imagery, it's much more expensive. All right. Well, I'll let you make the pitch then. How much is it? <laughs> It's twenty one ninety nine. You can okay. get it on Amazon. You can get it from the publisher. You can get it at local bookstores. Campus um, bookstore. Yeah, the campus bookstore. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Last uh, last question. What do each of you want folks to know about the University of Louisville um, Belknap campus? What would you tell them? Just Joe Schmo coming in, doesn't know anything about the University of Louisville. What would you want them to know? Um, I think it's a wonderful place to get an education. I think it's a wonderful place to work. I think it's a place where good things good things are happening yeah absolutely and the university of louisville uh, is is a uh, place where uh, uh, it's a nest it's a nurturing place um, and that um, uh, it's a place you can have fun it's a place where you can probe deeply. It's a place where you can make, mem make memories that are enduring. And that's the meaning of an effective and a positive university. All right. Tom Owen, Sherry Pawson, thanks for being on the show. Tom, always a great to see you. And Sherry, I miss seeing you as much as I used to. Same here. All right. <laughs> Their book is called The University of Louisville Belknap Campus. It's uh, part of the Campus History Series, and you can find it, as Sherry said, at several different places and might make a good Christmas gift or birthday present for somebody, especially U of L fans and folks interested in the University of Louisville. It seems that women are coming out of the woodwork these days to accuse politicians, bankers, CEOs of companies, radio personalities, men of all types, ages, and sizes of sexual harassment, sometimes going back years and years. So what started this whole movement of women having the ability and the fortitude to come forward and of the public now believing their stories? Where did it all start? Well, Joanne Sweeney is a law professor at the University of Louisville, and she's here to talk about some of these issues that have probably been raised at the kitchen table and in workplaces across America here in the in the past couple of months. Well, welcome, Joanne. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much. Um, so we talked, uh, you were mentioning the how kind of how this all started, and the most uh, well-known movement right now is the hashtag Me Too movement. And that actually started back in 1996 with a, a woman named Tarana Burke. And she told this story. She works, uh, at, uh, runs a nonprofit to help uh, young women of color um, and, and the issues that they have. Um, and some, some of them would be with uh, dealing with assault or other things like that. Um, and so she told this story and was talking uh, where a young woman told her uh, of a horrible thing that was happening to her. Her stepfather was abusing her. And she felt ill-equipped in the moment to deal with it. And she just wanted to tell her as the girl left. She sent her to a counselor and then felt awful because she couldn't talk to her about it and she wanted to tell her me too. Okay. And that was so that's where, where it started. Meeting, that's where it 21 started. 21 years ago. So for people like me who thought the hashtag me too movement with all these women coming forward these days, mm -hmm. it really started 21 years ago. Well, it so. didn't get much traction until it was picked up again actually by Alyssa Milano 
who um, used it as a hashtag in, um, on, on Twitter, and then it started picking up steam. So it didn't, it wasn't a movement until very recently. So you're not alone. I didn't know about it either until very recently. Um, and it's just been picking up. And, and what you were saying in, in your introduction, I think, was, is the key, that it's women telling their stories um, and being believed. And it started with women talking to each other. And the more you hear this me too, me too, and you start to realize you're not alone. And then it, it let other women be braver in telling their stories as well. And the very important thing about the me too hashtag is for a lot of women, they're not saying exactly what happened to them. They're just saying me too. And right. so they can acknowledge that they're part of this without having to delve back in and, and tell the details. Although some women are, and some women are naming names, right. which is leading to you know, these kind of sensational stories of these very powerful men that have been powerful for a very long time being um, fired, having projects pulled or whatever, for things, some, as you said, that happened decades ago. And women are finally feeling like they can talk and they aren't being silenced and they're being believed. And it's, it's a huge thing. Talking with Joanne Sweeney, who's a law professor at the Brandeis School of Law at the University of Louisville. We're talking about all of the sexual harassment and worse complaints that have been coming out uh, uh, from women all across the world, actually, uh, lately. So what's caused this cultural shift um, that now women, not only are they coming forward, but they're coming forward in groups mm -hmm. and also people are believing them yeah. and forcing these resignations and people to quit their jobs and be fired, et cetera. I think there's a few things going on. I think having social media is a huge piece of it because it allows women from all over the world to come together and talk um, in, in a somewhat anonymous way, which allows people to maybe be more honest or, or forthcoming with what has happened to them. And it's just been building and you get to this tipping point. And I think that that's what's also happened. We got to a tipping point where enough women are talking about it and there are enough women in the right places or, or sympathetic men, men who are allies, that things, all you needed was one. You need one Harvey Weinstein getting fired. And then all of a sudden women are suddenly realizing, oh, I will be believed and something might actually happen. Um, so that someone might actually care um, and do something about it and take these predatory men out of their positions where they can't prey on women anymore. And that just led to more and more and more. And it's, it's absolutely snowballing. Um, and it's just picking up more and more. And, and the industries I think we're seeing it the most in is the entertainment industry right. and, and in government. Mm -hmm. Those are the two big ones right now. And where you've had a number of resignations, a number of folks fired, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You know, there were some now that are taking this whole uh, Me Too movement and all these allegations of sexual harassment, Al Franken and others resigning, yeah. and they're taking it and saying, well, this is what we've been talking about uh, for years. This is the battle uh, against the white male. Um, <laughs> oh. or, or, or the or, yeah, I know you're chuckling, uh -huh. but, but there is that out there. Sure. That, saying, well, guys don't know what to do now. We, yeah. You know, can you, can you touch a woman on the arm? Can you uh, say she looks great in the workplace? Um, so... Where, it, where do we draw the line now? These discussions are happening, oh, which and is I a good think they, thing. They should absolutely, and I love that these discussions are happening because I think it's really good for men to suddenly realize, oh, maybe there are limits. I can't just do whatever I want whenever I want just because I feel like it. And so men are finally having to uh, approach social interactions the way women have been doing their entire lives, which is how am I being perceived? Is this, are they taking my signals the right way? Is this the right level of formality or is the social interaction going the way I want it to? And now men are being saddled with this burden and are unsure. And yes, I think we are. It, well, I think I, I'm married, so I don't have these other things, but uh, <laughs> happily, by the way, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and I think, and, and I'm actually glad. I'm glad that mm -hmm. men are uncomfortable. I think that that is the next step into getting us where we need to be with more you know, equality of treatment. And so if the question, if a man's saying, well, should I do this thing? The answer is probably, well, ask if you're not sure, or mm -hmm. you know, don't do it. You can go, go through a day without telling a woman she's pretty. That's okay. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we won't miss it. We really won't. <laughs> And so, but some, but some women like to be complimented sure. on how they look, right? I mean, sure. if you're wearing a pretty sweater and I walk up and say, hey, you look great today, is that okay? I mean, it depends. Unless, I'm a, unless I'm a creepy guy who's repeatedly said that, right? That's the, that's the key, right? Okay. It's context, right? Okay. So if it's your coworker and you've worked with them for a while and you have a friendly rapport, you're at a certain level of social interaction, then you should know how you can talk to it. I mean, men don't think about, well, can I say nice things to a, another man? Mm -hmm. treat, treat women like men. From a legal perspective, mm -hmm. I think one thing that everybody's learned out of this, if you're a boss or in a position of power, just don't 
just don't do it. I mean, Agreed. If, you're, if you're a coworker, it's a little bit different. Peers right? is a definitely a different situation. When you pull power dynamics into it and it's a boss, I mean, the, the, the people that have been pulled low are the people that are doing ridiculously and no one right. would think like that's probably i yeah, mean what right. how would she complain about that what yeah. he did to her right so the lesser things the kind of small interactions um that are that when men are starting to question themselves on again i think it's great to really reconsider how you're treating people in the workplace but i agree with you the real problem is when there's a power dynamic when it's a boss treating a subordinate and because they the the subordinate doesn't feel like they can object right and especially women because yep. women are taught not to Right. So it's 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 difficult and complicated. And I'm really pleased that we're moving in this direction and people are starting to question how they interact with each other, because I'm hoping something good will come out of it. Talk with Joanne Sweeney, who's from the UL uh, Brandeis School of Law uh, at the University of Louisville. Um, we're talking about sexual harassment and all these cases that have come up in the news uh, recently. And you've still got a president out there who's been accused of sexual harassment, mm -hmm. uh, says he didn't do any of it. Mm -hmm. um, can't really tell whether the American public believes him or doesn't believe him, but nothing has happened right. in this case. Right. So how does that fit in with this dynamic of all these women who have come forward and all these men who have resigned, quit, or been fired? How do you, how do you reconcile that with this cultural shift that appears to be happening? Well, all I can say is it's not a consistent cultural <laughs> shift, and most of the times they aren't. Yeah. So, you know, certain people, when you have, the problem is, is that he, you know, whether you like it or not, is the president, and there isn't his boss that can be like, you shouldn't have done that, and now you're fired. You know, he was in elected, elected positions are a little trickier, and, you know, you have these people in the Senate, like Al Franken we talked about, who were at, basically told to resign by their leadership of the party, but there's no one to tell the president what you did was wrong. Although it's not over, there are people trying to bring lawsuits right, and things like right. that, so he's not hopefully getting away unscathed, but I think the problem is that a lot of people either don't believe it or believe it but don't care. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that those are the people that are kind of left behind in this movement and become the minority. Because um, it is difficult to reconcile what's happening in some areas and then, you know, we've got this shining example of the opposite. <laughs> if you were general counsel for a company right now, mm -hmm. what would you be telling um, your bosses, uh, the CEOs and the board members of those companies about sexual harassment and the policies of that business? So I would, I would definitely recommend um, some really thorough sexual harassment training for all employees to kind of reset um, normal, like a, the culture in the office. I would, you know, every office has a different culture, but I think there should be, you know, some guidelines that everyone should abide by. I would certainly emphasize um, the dynamics, again, between a boss and a subordinate mm -hmm. um, and uh, emphasize, you know, just ask permission before you do stuff. Hey, do you um, mind if I hug you? Yes, I would uh, rather be asked. That's kind of goofy, know? though. That it is, but I mean, and again, this may be the awkward middle phase before we yeah. get to the place we want to be, and I'm okay with it being awkward right now if we get somewhere good. Okay. So if someone's going to ask me, for, my husband's like, should I ask for hugs? I'm like, yeah, I think okay. you should, okay. just for now. Okay. Just to see, you know, where we get end up. Get through this up. dicey period here. It's, it's a real, um, it's uh, moving so fast, mm -hmm. and so many things are happening all at once in so many different areas that people are unsure and I think that is normal and makes sense and if you're unsure then you should just talk about it and we should communicate better and that should be the end result right that we should all communicate better and develop a new normal and we can't do that without going through this really weird awkward place where people are asking probably more than they need to but I'd rather err in that direction right. at this point all right Joanne Sweeney great having you on the show thank you thanks for listening and go cards